Thank you very much, Professor Hamdi. Good morning, uh, everybody. So when your boss rings you up at 10 o'clock at night and says, you're under absolutely no obligation to say yes to this, you know that you're under quite a lot of obligation to say yes to it. Um, but no, I'm, I'm joking. It's a, it's a pleasure, uh, it's an honour to, to speak to you all today. Um, for those of you expecting a Harvey Weinstein-esque expose of the training culture in upper GI uh, surgery in Oxford, I'm afraid you'll have to wait for another whistleblower. But I'm actually going to talk about um, the use of PET-CT uh, in not just staging but managing uh, esophagastric cancer. Um, so I'm going to run through a few things. So it's, it's really sort of a series of papers that we've, that we've published from the unit. Um, and central to all of this is really moving from thinking about PET and other staging investigations as a binary test that you do once, we do at one moment in time that tells you something, do they have incurable disease or not, moving towards sort of gleaning all the wealth of extra information that you get from that and using that as biomarkers to predict useful things and ultimately to personalise the, the patient journey. So, so very briefly, so PET-CT, so positron emission tomography. Uh, so a patient uh, is injected with a, a, a biologically active tracer. Uh, so here, and generally most commonly, uh, that's fluorine labelled um, uh, glucose molecule. So that circulates, that gets taken up differently uh, by different tissues in the body. Um, and it's then measured, so the amount that's, uh, that's taken up everywhere is measured by beta decay. And that gives you a, a metric of, of how much is there and so how hot the tissue appears, so its avidity. Uh, and that's generally quantified using a, a, an SUV, which is the standardised uh, uptake value. And then from that, there's a number of derivative metrics. So SUV max, the maximum standardised uptake value, uh, and then some avidity and, and spatial metrics as well that we'll talk about. Um, that's then combined typically with CT. So as you can see there uh, on the right-hand side, so at the top is a CT image. Um, in the middle is the PET image, and then you get that lovely composite there. Um, and what's very interesting is what this avidity actually means. So not just cancer is avid, obviously inflammation and other things are avid, and you're, you know, generally all the tissues in the body are to some extent avid. Um, in cancer, it generally means that you've that you can't use the glucose. So that accumulates because you can't use it. And either that's because you've disrupted the aerobic respiration cycle, and particularly uh, esophageal and gastric cancer has got a very high mutational burden, so typically it just doesn't work, so they can't uh, metabolize the glucose, or that the tumor is hypoxic uh, for various reasons. Again, you see that with solid, solid tumors quite frequently. So again, they can't use uh, the, the, the glucose. But you know, it's very interesting. There's, there's quite a few tumors that, you know, within ostensibly similar esophageal and gastric cancers. Some are very avid, some aren't. They behave very similarly, so it's not completely explained. So very briefly to talk through how, how we generally stage esophageal and gastroesophageal junctional cancer, uh, which I'll, I'll lump together. So the synthesis of international guidelines are that patients should have a, a, a contrast uh, a CT scan of their chest, abdomen, and pelvis. If that doesn't show metastases, they should proceed to have an endoscopic ultrasound scan, uh, and that's uh, recommended because that's the most accurate modality for T stage and for local end stage. A PET-CT uh, is recommended for all but the very earliest tumours, so all other than uh, one at T1A tumours, so confined to the mucosa, uh, and then a laparoscopy for those which may have metastasized within the peritoneal cavity. Um, depending on how you, you define altering your management, PET's very useful. Uh, estimates range that it alters management between one in six and one in three patients. Um, and that's been well established, but what we were more interested in is whether we can use it selectively and can we use that extra information uh, to do useful things. I'll present some, some stats, I apologise, there's quite a lot of numbers uh, in all of this. Um, generally, if I present something as uh, significant, it's from multivariate regression. There's some fancy modelling uh, in there, logistic regression, um, decision trees, which is recursive partitioning, which is sequential logistic regression, and some artificial neural networks as well. But all of those things I'll present, they've been validated to some extent, either temporarily with a separate set or internally with, with bootstrapping to look at the variability of it. So. Pragmatic staging. So the first thing that we did was we published this in 2015 in the BJS. Um, so this was a database that I, I created of nearly a thousand patients uh, who we, so all the patients that we'd staged in Oxford with esophageal and junctional cancer beyond a CT scan um, from uh, 2006 to 2014. First seven years is the development set for the models, the last year is the validation set. And generally patients had a CT scan, then an EUS, then a PET, and then maybe a laparoscopy. Um, and we had uh, 918 patients who'd had a PET. So sort of 
going through this very briefly, so that's 800 patients in that, that first development set. Um, 100 of these patients, there were possible metastases on their CT scan, and then they had a PET, and in about 50% of those cases, PET confirmed that they, these were indeed metastases, refuting it in the other half. But the important thing to note in this is that of those 50% of, those, um, uh, 50 of patients uh, with confirmed metastases, the PET scan identified additional METs that were not seen on their CT scan. So that's a common theme uh, that, that emerges throughout all of this. Um, we found unsuspected metastases uh, in about one in seven of the patients in whom the CT scan hadn't suggested it, and a few other things, you know, other cancers that were unexpected, high-risk colonic polyps, uh, etc. So putting that all together, if you use that to defi uh, as a change in management, uh, PET alters your management in about one in four patients, generally by identifying unsuspected metastases, and that's in 13% of patients, that's a lot of patients, um, or confirming metastases. So, I mean, you know, that tells you what we already know, which is PET is useful um, and it's a, a good thing to do. But what's more interesting is whether or not you can do this selectively. Uh, and to do this, um, you use decision theory uh, calculations. So if you know the diagnostic performance of your test, so for PET that's finding metastases, um, so if you know it's false positive rate, it's false negative rate, etc., you can estimate the risks and the benefits of those to patients uh, and you can calculate what's called a probability threshold. So that's the pretest probability of finding a thing, which in this case is a metastasis, um, at which the, so if you're above that probability threshold, the risk of the test, uh, which in this case is radiation risk and lifetime cancer risk, that risk is lower than the potential benefit. If it's below that, uh, then the risk outweighs the potential benefit and you shouldn't do the test. Um, so we found that you can predict patients who've got unsuspected metastases on PET to an extent, basically, if you've got a, a, a more advanced TNN stage. But as you'll see there, the probability threshold is incredibly small. It's less than a tenth of a percent. Uh, and no amount of fancy modelling, unfortunately, will be able to identify those patients. So what this tells you is that, um, is that PET CT is indicated routinely for all patients. <laughs> So you can't personalise your PET, but can you use your PET to personalise your other staging investigations? So one of the things that we thought a lot about with this was whether we can be more selective with our EUS. So as I've said, that's recommended routinely, but really what it's, what it's useful for is identifying very early cancers or very advanced cancers. So those are the T1N0 cancers that you can either cut out endoscopically or you, you um, perform an esophagectomy without chemotherapy, which is important, you know, you can action your treatment on the basis of that, or T4B tumours that are growing into something that you can't cut out. Um, and because EUS is a lot more invasive, there's risk of perforation and bleeding, etc. your probability threshold is higher. So that's 1.7%. Um, now, you can use CT scan, uh, we found, to partition patients to an extent on this. So, as you might expect, if your CT scan doesn't suggest T1N0 disease, you probably don't have T1N0 disease. So, if your CT was T2 to T4A, then there was uh, only a 0.4% probability that you've actually got T1N0 disease. But, of course, there still are a few false negatives in there that you want to tease out. So, we then looked at using the information on PET to give a, a modified decision tree, ideally to, to see if we can be more selective about EUS. And what we see with that is, again, there's a common theme throughout all of these presentations, is that the avidity of the primary tumour on the PET is useful, but also, independently of that, is the avidity of the nodes on that. So, these are presumed nodal metastases, um, which are PET avid, they're hot on PET, versus nodal metastases, which are PET negative. So this is a, the sort of decision tree on there, which is sort of slightly complicated, but basically, it, on the basis of your CT scan, you can then incorporate your PET scan. Um, so if you've got possible T1 disease on your CT scan, if you have got FDG avid nodes, you don't have T1N0 disease. You've got T2 or above disease, don't do an EUS. Um, if you don't, then you may well do, so you should do an EUS. If you have got T2 and above disease on your CT scan, which is about three quarters, um, uh, probably more patients, um, you can partition on the basis of the avidity, the SUV max of your primary tumour. If it's above 6.4, which isn't that hot, um, then there's no chance that you've got T1N0 disease, don't do an EUS. If it's below that, so it's not very avid, depending on how long it is, uh, and that's the, the, the length on PET, so the avid length, you can then split those patients. <clears throat> so we then incorporated this into a pragmatic sort of modified staging algorithm um, to, to use our resources um, uh, most efficiently. And w w what that would mean is that you can basically get rid of three quarters of your EUS. So that saves a lot of money, a lot of inconvenience for patients, and it speeds things up as well. And avoids the risk of having an EUS.
So that's staging. Um, so we then move forward to restaging. So we published this last year in European Radiology. So in contrast to staging, um, PET CT isn't recommended after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So you have a PET, you have some chemotherapy or chemoradiotherapy, you want to reass reassess the cancer at that point, the response to that, really to look for metastatic disease, um, but PET isn't recommended for that. Um, but that's been done routinely um, uh, here since 2009. So the next step was moving from those nearly 1,000 patients, looking at those patients uh, who had had a PET, had had chemotherapy, and then either had a CT scan or a PET. And that's generally split historically uh, from 2009. So uh, in total, that's, that's 383 patients. So an indirect comparison of the two would suggest that PET is twice as sensitive, again, we sort of saw that before, for detecting disease progression. So that's metastatic disease. You're therefore not going to operate on these people after chemotherapy. So it's 6% versus 3%. We then did a direct comparison in those patients who'd had a PET because they've had a PET and they've had a CT. And you can see that, again, about half of those metastases you can only see on the PET scan. Now, of course, it's not completely accurate. Um, despite this, we know that a substantial number of patients that will have an abandoned esophagectomy because there's small volume metastatic disease that you can't see on the scan. Um, now, that was surprisingly high, actually. It's about 10% of patients, um, which makes PET about 40% sensitive for incurable disease. But again, that's twice as sensitive, which is significantly more than CT scan. Decision theory, again, suggests that it's indicated routinely, uh, and the number needed to treat for doing PET, because PET's a lot more expensive, it's about 900 quid versus uh, 100 um, for a whole body PET scan. So it's more expensive, but if you do this routinely, your number needed to treat is 23. So that's 23 PETs that prevent a futile esophagectomy, and the net cost of that is, is minimal. So again, you know, you'd probably expect that. It's, it's not that interesting, uh, but it's useful. Um, but the more interesting thing is, can you use these PET variables to predict how likely patients are uh, to progress during their chemotherapy? And at the moment, there, there's no, you know, no biological or imaging markers that will, that will tell you that. Everybody gets chemotherapy. In some of them, it works. In some of them, it doesn't. And if it doesn't work, those patients do worse. Um, so looking at the PET scan before chemotherapy, again, we see that the avidity of the primary tumour and the nodes are independently predictive of this. So a longer tumour and patients with FDG avid nodes, they were more likely. So that's before chemotherapy, they're more likely to progress to metastatic disease during chemotherapy. So I drilled into this a little bit more with, with FDG avid nodes to try and create a, a metabolic nodal stage. So that's analogous to the N bit of the TNM classification. Um, and using rock curves, you can split that into two two groups, so that's patients with just one or two avid nodes, patients with more than two avid nodes. And you can see there that your odds ratio of, of disease progression goes up substantially, it kind of doubles when you get above two avid nodes. And the most interesting and important thing to stress about this is that this is above and beyond, it's independent of your, of your radiological nodal stage. And when you look at those patients who have on CT or EUS, they've got nodal METs, if those are FDG negative, they're not hot on the PET scan, your risk of disease progression is incredibly small. If they're FDG avid, your risk is incredibly high. So this tells you that the avidity of the nodes, it's telling you something, it's a surrogate marker of the behavior of the cancer. Uh, so, um, you know, is that a surrogate marker of its chemosensitivity? Is that its metastatic phenotype? Um, so that's very interesting. So moving forward to identifying those patients who have an abandoned esophagectomy. So clearly that's, that, again, is very important to know the false negatives uh, on your restaging scan. Um, and again, you see the primary tumour and the nodes independently predict this. So the primary tumour, again, a longer tumour is worse. A longer avid tumour is worse. Um, interesting, the SUV max, the lower the SUV max at this stage, the less visible on the PET, the more likely you are to have unresectable disease. Presumably your, your small volume metastases are, are less hot on the PET. And again, we see that if you've still got FDG avid nodes despite chemotherapy, which implies that those clones that have metastasized within those nodes, they're chemo resistant, unsurprisingly, you do, these patients do incredibly badly. And the risk goes up the more nodes you've got. And again, this is independent of your nodal stage. So those are kind of static measurements uh, of your avidity on, on, on PET. So what about the metabolic response? So this is looking at the difference between your first scan before chemotherapy and your second scan afterwards and seeing what the percentage reduction in your avidity of the tumour in the nodes is. Uh, and this is commonly quantified using something called the persist criteria, which is a somewhat arbitrary um, threshold of a 30% reduction in your, in your avidity. So if it goes down by 30% of your primary tumour, you've apparently responded. 
Um, so we found when looking at this that actually the metabolic tumour response, so that is the response on PET of your tumour, the primary tumour, this did not predict whether or not you'd have an abandoned resection. But the metabolic nodal response, which is, is something that we, that we developed, it does. And we split this into a complete metabolic nodal response. So you had avid nodes, they then went with a chemotherapy through progressive, uh, partial metabolic response, stable metabolic disease, and then the very unlucky people with progressive metabolic disease. Um, metastatic disease um, despite chemotherapy. And those patients who didn't have a complete metabolic response to their nodes had a one in four chance of having incurable disease and abandoned resection. Actually, if their tumour was impassable at endoscopy, that goes up to, to 75%. So I would argue that these are, these are high-risk patients that we can identify before the event of surgery. We can tell them that, and that may alter their, their management decisions. And we can also... Um, concentrate our restaging resources on these patients. Should we be doing extra cross-sectional imaging? Should we be doing you know, a restaging laparoscopy going inside the lesser sac, really trying to prove that these patients don't have metastatic disease? <clears throat> So that leads us on, on sort of nicely to, to metabolic response um, and the Municon trial. So this is a paper in 2007 in the Lancet Oncology. Basically, uh, a group from Munich um, did a PET, gave a cycle of cisplatin and 5-FU chemotherapy. If the uh, did another PET after that one cycle. If the SUV max hadn't dropped by 35%, uh, then they were, uh, they were a non-responder, they aborted their chemotherapy, they went straight to surgery. If it had responded by 35%, um, they were a responder, they had more chemotherapy, and then went to surgery. And rather unsurprisingly, a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you stop the chemotherapy, the patients don't respond. And they did worse, but it was uncontrolled. But it's very, you know, that's a landmark paper, and that sort of is a teaser for the way that we may be able to go uh, with, with personalising chemotherapy. I'll sort of run through, run through this very quickly, but this um, was the next stage, which was using PET to predict your pathological tumour response. So that's the microscopic regression. It's the gold standard um, of your, uh, your tumour's response to chemotherapy, again, of the primary tumour. Um, and we found that generally, metabolic tumour response associates with pathological tumour response. The persist criteria was a bit low. It should probably over double it to 75% reduction. But again, your avidity of your tumour and the, the, the volume of your tumour or your length are independent predictors of this. So this suggests that you can refine your prediction using composite metrics, um, things like metabolic tumour volume, which we don't do as standard, and they're generally better. But again, the thing to stress is this is really imperfect. There are some patients who've got a profound response on their PET of their primary tumour. They still have got incurable disease. <clears throat> but the more interesting, you know, that's, been, that's been demonstrated to an extent before, but the more interesting things here is how does metabolic nodal response fit into this? So we found looking at this that your primary tumour response and your nodal response are statistically independent. So they're linked, but they're independent. And they're discordant in a lot of patients. They're discordant in about a fifth of patients. So for, generally, that's that the primary tumour is responding on the PET or pathologically, but the nodal tumour isn't. And I think that's critical to stress because if you're using a trial, and there, there are a few other trials doing this, if you're using your metabolic response on PET of your primary tumour, you may look at that and say, well, it's not responding and give up chemotherapy. But actually, there's a one in five chance that your nodes are responding to chemotherapy. And I'd argue that that's the most important bit to know because these are the, these are the cancer clones that have proven metastatic behaviour and you've got a surrogate of their chemosensitivity. And then prognosis. So this translates forward into, into prognosis. So if you look after surgery, um, you can see that, your, that the metabolic response of your primary tumour on PET is, you know, it doesn't predict your prognosis once you adjust for pathological response, but your metabolic nodal response does, and that's independent of your, patholo your, your pathological nodal stage. Um, you can see a, a, a Kaplan-Meier curve there, so the, the blue at the top, uh, uh, most of the patients are the ones who don't have FDG avid nodes. Then you've got those patients in red who did have FDG avid nodes, had chemotherapy, the nodes went, their prognosis reverts to baseline. It's, it's relatively good. If they've still got avid nodes despite chemotherapy, you can see that's the green line at the bottom. They've got an appalling prognosis. Uh, and what that really translates into um, is there are 40, nearly a 50% chance of having death or recurrence at one year, a 70% chance at two years. So these are really high-risk patients. And again, to stress, that's independent of your, of your pathological nodal stage. If you've got pathologically involved nodes, but they're negative on PET, your hazard ratio for disease-free survival is two. If those pathologically involved nodes are FDG avid, your hazard ratio doubles. <clears throat> and so very finally, so just to, just to talk about gastric cancer, because all of this has been based on esophageal and junctional cancer. 
The evidence is much less in gastric cancer. Uh, I'm going to whiz through this, but basically, people don't really use PET for gastric cancer because historically people have considered that gastric cancer is, is very often PET negative, and that's particularly true for diffuse subtype of gastric cancer. So we don't really know the implications of any of this. So this is a very similar study, which is hot off the press, um, which has looked at all of the non-junctional gastric adenocarcinomas in Oxford over that time period that we've staged, uh, staged with a PET basically over 10 years. And you see, in contrast to what people have generally thought, I'll sort of skim over all of this, basically, four out of five gastric cancers are FDG avid. You can't predict that on the basis of the subtype, which is a very important thing to say. So you can't predict this utility at the baseline. And 7% of patients have got unsuspected metastases on their, on their PET scan. So it's an incredibly useful investigation. And as I say, one that isn't done routinely. Um, moving forward to those patients who have incurable disease, so your pet's normal, you don't have metastases, but then you find it at laparoscopy or you find it at surgery. And again, you see that pets are about 50% sensitive, but it's very highly specific for incurable disease. Decision theory, you can't select patients routinely for pets, similar to esophageal cancer. But again, your metabolic nodes, so this holds true in gastric cancer, if you've got FDG avid nodes, it's really bad, and it predicts your metastases. So a third of patients in gastric cancer have got hot nodes on PET, a third of those patients have also got metastases on their PET scan. If you include all your other staging investigations, that's 50% of patients versus 15% of patients. And you can predict those patients who have not got METs on their PET scan, but who, um, who will have on laparoscopy or surgery, you can select those patients out with this. And again, risk goes up with the more nodes you have, independent of your nodal stage. If you've got FDG avid nodes on your staging uh, PET scan with gastric cancer, you do worse. Again, your disease-free survival hazard ratio is, is over two. Again, that's independent. Um, and this is you know, very, very small numbers here. Um, but again, it seems as though PET is probably more sensitive for predicting uh, uh, disease progression on your restaging scan as well. And again, that's something we've only moved to relatively routinely, and I'm not aware that, that anybody else does this. And again, it's a, it's a, you know, your metabolic nodal response appears to be a negative prognostic marker as well uh, in gastric cancer. And again, you can use your metabolic nodal stage as a biomarker for these patients. They're again, they're at very, very high risk of disease, uh, of, of recurrence or death at two years. No patients with FDG avid nodes uh, uh, before surgery were alive at five years. That's a very important thing to know. So in summary, I'm sorry there's quite a lot of, uh, a lot of things that I, I've talked about there, but basically we see what we, what we probably knew, which is that PET scans are useful for staging and restaging cancer, uh, esophageal and gastric cancer, and it's probably twice as sensitive as CT scan. But more interestingly, it gives you a lot of extra information, um, which I think is a surrogate uh, of the, the, the phenotype of your cancer uh, that's very, very useful. The primary tumour, so its avidity and its, and its um, spatial metrics, can you use that to personalise your staging? I think you can. Can you use that to predict your pathological tumour response, which is a critical thing to know? Probably. But the nodal tumour, um, again, this is, it hasn't really been looked at, but this is you know, an independent thing that's very useful. You can personalise your staging, you can predict your disease progression, and you can prognosticate on the basis of it. So that tells us that patients with FDG avid nodes are a very high risk subset of patients. You can counsel them before surgery, you can do extra investigations on them, and importantly, this is often discordant with the primary tumour, and that's an important thing to know for, for designing trials. And I think this gives you, as I've said, vital surrogate information. So just to touch on the future, so where, where should we go with this? Well, of course, what's the molecular basis of this? So why are some, some nodes positive? Why are they negative? I did look at this a bit with some, with some exome sequencing. Uh, couldn't figure it out, a bit complicated. But I, I suspect that this is all to do with clones. So you've got a handful of clones of your primary tumour, some of which are avid, some aren't. They then go to your nodes, and you've only got one or two clones there. So you kind of purify the, uh, the, the PET scan on that basis. Um, I think this is probably a metabolic nodal response. I think it's probably a surrogate, and it's probably imperfect of pathological nodal response, which isn't something that we look at, but it's something that we're trying to look at. So the histological regression of your nodal metastases. And clinically, how can we, how can we sort of action things on the basis of this? So can we use this to, to personalise our, our chemotherapy and chemo radiotherapy regimens? I would suggest yes, if we do interval PET scans during treatment, look at the tumour, look at the nodal tumour and see if it's responding. Can we incorporate serial biopsy and other things into all of this? And I think very interestingly, can we use this? We can identify high-risk patients. Can we concentrate our follow-up resources on these patients and, and, again, prognosticate for them? Because we've got very little mechanism to do this at the moment.
Uh, so I'm very grateful to a lot of people who've helped me collect with this data. Obviously, the, the upper GI MDT, um, the notable names uh, on, the, on the board there, um, but there's, there's uh, too many other people to mention. But thank you very much. Um, thank you, Freddie. So I'm not going to take up too much time. This is a little bit about data, which is inherently boring. So I'm going to try and spice it up a little bit. But it's essentially about the national database we've developed for esophagogastric cancer. It's more than 20 years at the first ago that the first cancer report came out, um, the Kalmanheim report, which emphasised the importance of cancer registration and careful monitoring of treatment and outcomes. Um, and it's been a constant theme of the improving outcomes guidance that the aspiration is to really for us to achieve cancer outcomes which are comparable with the best in the world. And any report that comes out of the, uh, on cancer outcomes tends to make us compare rather unfavourably with other countries around the world. Um, this was a very well-known American surgeon a few decades ago who was quoted as saying, um, when talking about esophageal cancer, my boy, when you see a patient with esophageal cancer, you'll do more with a quart of whiskey than with anything the current medical establishment has to offer. Um, that may be the case occasionally, but I think we are a little bit better at treating it now. Um, this was the very first successful transthoracic esophagectomy um, back in 1913, more than 100 years ago now. Um, a squamous cell carcinoma, a transthoracic resection. They didn't know how to reconstruct in those days. So that black tube is a bicycle inner tube that was sutured into the cervical esophagus and into the stomach. And this patient survived for 10 years on a liquid diet before dying of a myocardial infarction. Um, so a heroic surgical feat. We are better at reconstructing these days, I hasten to add. And quality of life has assumed more importance now. Um, this has been one of the most fundamental changes in esophageal cancer treatment worldwide in the last 20 years. And it's, it's essentially the centralisation of esophagogastric cancer services. And I think that's probably happened more in the UK than anywhere else in the world. And it's all predicated on the volume outcome relationship, which is very obvious in this slide, showing the more you do, the better the outcomes. And this was a very well off-quoted paper in the New England Journal of Medicine um, 14 years ago from America looking again at this problem and defining it in terms of um, volumes of a soft tissue was done. What's interesting about this paper is this again is the states. What they define as a very high volume centre is more than 19 esophagectomies a year. We do about 90 esophagectomies a year in Oxford. And again, in America, this centralisation has not happened anything much as like um, it has in the United Kingdom. And when you look at high volume centres, you can get mortality rates much lower than that. This is a Kaplan Meyer curve for our survival, for our patients. This was from a paper we did, a, a joint paper with the Bristol unit. But this curve refers only to our patients, all of our patients having neoadjuvant treatment, therefore patients with T2 disease and above, excluding early cancers. And we do, we, survive, we um, provide this service for a population of two and a half million, 90 resections an annum, and our in-hospital mortality is now 0.9% and our five-year survival is about 50%, with a median survival, to, with, with a median follow-up as described there. So the outcomes from esophageal cancer surgery have improved enormously over the last 20 years. Now, concurrent with this centralisation in the United Kingdom in the last 17 years has been the development of the National Esophagogastric Cancer Audit. This is one of the national audits mandated about 12 years ago um, by the uh, NHS England. Um, and the chap in the middle is Richard Hardwick, who's an exact contemporary of mine, who set up the, the, the esophageal unit in Cambridge and set up this cancer audit. He handed over to me several years ago. And I now lead this with a team as described on the left. It's, a, it's, it's commissioned by the Health Quality Improvement Programme and it's, it's carried out by a collaboration between the Royal College of Surgeons, the BSG, Orgis, and the Royal College of Radiologists together with NHS Digital. And the key feature, it, it provides wonderful information for benchmarking, quality improvement, and what I believe is very important, standardization of practice. Um, it evaluates, it, it deals with epithelial tumors of the esophagus and the stomach. It evaluates care from the diagnosis to the end of the initial therapy. Um, diagnosis, staging, decisions about treatment planning, and the use of surgery, oncology, palliation, um, and the outcomes of care for these treatment pathways. 
And I thought I'd illustrate it just by talking about some of the key findings from last year's report. We're about to produce this year's report. So we look at high-grade dysplasia, I should add as well, associated with Barrett's esophagus, but it's particularly esophagogastric cancer. Diagnosis, staging, treatment, surgery, palliation, and survival after diagnosis. In the last report last year, we compared the first two cohorts. The first cohort was three years, 2007 to 9, and the second cohort, 2013 to 15. Um, and you can see in here, we're, we're, we're looking at very big numbers of, of tumours. Nearly 20,000 tumours in the second cohort, and nearly 5,000 operations for these cancers. Um, we look at a whole host of things, and this is really a hodgepodge of some of the data we get. Um, the proportion diagnosed following emergency admission, much higher than many cancers, but it is falling. And one of the targets over the next couple of years is to try and explore why that is still relatively higher than other cancers. Um, the number of patients managed with curative intent has gone up between those two cohorts from 36 to nearly 38%. But what's interesting about this is the variability between different areas around the country. In some areas, a much higher proportion of patients being treated radically than in other parts of the country. Some of this is to do with data acquisition, but there is clearly variable practice around the country. What about the use of different types of surgical approaches? Well, this is one slide we've looked at with minimally invasive surgery. Currently, for esophagectomy, about 37% of patients currently, compared to 30% 10 years ago, have some form of minimally invasive approach to their esophagectomy, whether it's a hybrid operation, doing a laparoscopy and an open thoracotomy, or a total minimally invasive esophagectomy. For gastrectomy, it's much lower, 15%. I don't know why that is, but it's much less than with esophageal surgery. And again, the use of neoadjuvant treatment, far more now have it with chemotherapy and recently chemoradiotherapy than in the first cohort. What about outcomes? Well, we look at 30-day mortality rate, in-hospital mortality rate, 90-day mortality rate, and more recently, one-year survival. And the in-hospital mortality rate for esophagectomy has gone down from 4.5% down to 1.9% in the most recent um, uh, 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 audit. Again, this is associated with the centralisation, and that is clearly one of the major causative factors. So, and length of stay is reduced too. You can produce funnel plots of the mortality. You can look all the, each of these dots re refers to each individual unit, and you can look, look at where you are benchmarking your unit against other units, and again for 90-day 90, 90 mortality. One-year survival as well we're looking at, and again you can see um, some uh, uh, where you are compared to other places in the country. No outliers, but there are clearly some significant differences between different units. Again, we look at extensively at palliative treatment. We're not very good at collecting data on on end-of-life care, but we're trying to do that in much more detail over the next few years. But again, we know that this is a disease that you can't cure most people in, and two-thirds will end up having palliative treatment. And we can see how the variation in palliative chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgery, endoscopic palliation varies throughout the country. We produce annual reports which is online. We produce local reports for every hospital. The medical director of every hospital will get a local report telling him or her how their unit is doing and action plans that are recommended for that unit. And of course, there are multiple presentations at a variety of conferences, and we regularly produce um, uh, 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 three or four um, uh, um, papers a year based on the output from the audit. You can also get surgeon level outcomes, and I'm going to talk a bit about this, where you can go online, your patients can go online and look at your mortality rate from esophagectomy. Now, the media has always loved medicine, and particularly when things go wrong. Um, and this is just one example, and the Daily Mail in particular is full of disasters and good news stories, but the media loves it, and there is an ever-growing ever clamour for information about outcomes from surgery. They love it more when things go wrong, but patients also, want, also increasingly want to know how good you are. And some of you will remember, not all of you, or most of you should have heard about the Bristol Heart Scan. Now, this really was an event that, that started, was, was the precipitant for the 
for the, for the move to publish online consultant outcome data. This was back in the uh, nearly about 15, 16 years ago when paediatric cardiac surgery in Bristol um, was in the news. A whistleblower and an anaesthetist um, 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 whistle blew and talked about some very poor outcomes. And this really led from pe babies having heart surgery. And this led to um, the publication of consultant outcome data. And the first one, came, the first um, move to do this was, it was about five years ago, and it, it was in all the news, and various specialties were mandated to publish online consultant outcome data for a variety of procedures. Now, there are a couple of vascular surgeons here. Unfortunately, I felt very sorry for the Vascular Surgical Society because they were the, the very first surgical society that published their data. And I think a lot of the other associations learned from some of the difficulties in that. These two individuals were vascular surgeons who were on the front page of the um, Sunday Mail and Mail Online with their supposedly very poor outcome data. I, don't know, I know one of these surgeons. I train with one of them, actually. And I think it was a very false representation, I understand, of what the data truly was. But nevertheless, their faces were, were splattered all over the press because of what were thought to be poor outcome data. Now, we were mandated to do it um, at the same time. We were lucky enough that we weren't the first society to publish, and we learned a lot about how it had been presented in the media with other societies. So um, it caused a lot of controversy. A lot of people did not want to do this, as you can imagine, and it took a lot of cajoling and persuading that we had to do this, um, and it would look much worse if we didn't publish any data at all. So. Um, in, in the first one we produced was September 2013, and it produced some interesting systems. The median annual hospital volume was 56. We all thought all the centres had centralised so well that each surgeon was doing lots and lots of these operations. But in fact, the median annual surgical volume was only 14. But very pleasingly, the mortality rates for all the trusts and all the individual surgeons were within the expected range. This is what you can get online now. Um, and this is for Oxford. This is, I think, a year or two ago. You can see our hospital is there in the middle of it. We're now up to about here because we've taken on all the Berkshire work now. Um, and you can look at all the individual surgeons who carried out esophagectomies during that time period. And you can see what the number of operations done, the 30-day mortality adjusted, 90-day mortality length of stay. So the data is there. It's a continual battle to get funding for this. We're now joining with the National Bowel Cancer Audit, um, um, separate clinical leads but joint administration methodology. We link to various national databases, HES data obviously, the Office of National Statistics to get mortality rates, the radiotherapy data set, we're trying to link with the national chemotherapy data set, the intensive care database and primary care. We're looking now at, at means of assessing adequacy or, or radicality of surgery to try and get more sophisticated outcome data so we can publish that. And this is just an example of what we're producing in this year's report. We're now reporting on the, on the, the, number, the, the, the adequacy of the lymphadenectomy produced during an esophagectomy and a gastrectomy. It's pretty raw data. Again, this has caused a bit of upset with some of my colleagues around the country, um, and it needs refining, but it gives an idea of how many, how radical the lymphadenectomy, which I think most of us believe is an absolutely core part of doing this surgery. And most people are around the same level, but there are some units which have very, very low lymph node yields, and one needs to question why that is and whether they should be doing that surgery or be doing it differently. Looking at circumferential resection margins, again, it's a good marker of how radical your operation is, and the same arguments apply to that. Likewise, longitudinal resection margins, most of them very, very low, as they should do. But this unit, doing a fair number, 15% longitudinal margin positivity. That implies inadequate surgery being done. And it's a really important marker, I think, of, 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 way we can, of ways we can try and improve the quality of surgery. This is just something which is literally produced by one of our statisticians last week, um, looking at, at, at 
analysis of those having adequate lymphatic lymphatics, and not surprisingly, early stage disease, you're less likely to have big lots of nodes than if it's advanced stage disease. Now, we're meant to do the same operation, whether it's early disease or, 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 or advanced disease, but clearly we're not. There are clearly people who are reducing the radicality of surgery for early stage disease, which is an interesting finding in its own right. If you have neoadjuvant therapy, we know that giving people neoadjuvant chemo therapy reduces your lymph node yield. But this is an interesting finding. If you're carrying out minimally invasive surgery, open versus minimally invasive, you're getting less lymph nodes with the minimally invasive surgery. Now, this is, I think, really powerful data. If you look at the papers published about minimally invasive surgery, and for those that don't know, it's never really taken off in the chest for esophageal cancer. It has in a few enthusiastic centres, but it's a difficult way to do it, and there's always been a concern about the oncological outcomes. If you look at the publications from enthusiasts, of course, they do very radical operations and they produce great data. But look at real-time data, observational data from a huge series of 6,000 patients. It is clear that in real life they're not doing as radical an operation as we do with open surgery. Positive longitudinal margins. Again, exactly the same argument in terms of minimally invasive surgery. So one might argue it, it's not significant with circumferential resection margins, and I won't go over all the other uh, multivariates, but it seems to be clear from this that, as suspected, some people will be compromising the radicality of the operation in order to do it minimally invasively. A couple of final slides. This is some really interesting information. You'll all, anyone who deals with cancer will know about our 31-day targets and our 62-day targets. Um, and the 31-day target is from the decision to treat the cancer to the date of first treatment. When this target was first introduced, it was actually the date of diagnosis to the date of first treatment. But officially, that was changed because it was thought it was too difficult to pin down the date of diagnosis. I think some data we've got might suggest this was changed for political reasons rather than um, those reasons. So we, th these are people who are not on the two-week wait, and by and large, these targets are nearly always achieved. They're never a problem for trust in this country these days. But, and you can see 99% success rate. Now, if you apply the same data but use the date of diagnosis, which was the original intent, so you're... The new definition hides that time between date of diagnosis and date of decision to treat, the time it takes to stage the cancers. And this is not collected in any of these patients by the current targets. And you can see that the delays are much greater. So there's this hidden delay, which is not obvious with the current government targets. And maybe that decision to, to change the, 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 the definition was made for reasons other than ease. So there are hidden delays which this sort of data and this audit of this huge number of patients can reveal. Um, so I'm going to finish now. How much should we tell the public about outcomes of esophageal Well, they're going to know anyway because all our results are going to be online. At the moment for esophageal gastric cancer is just mortality rates and um, length of stay. But it's coming. You'll have your complication rates, your anastomotic leak rates, your nodal yields, your margin positivity, your one-year survival, your long-term survival. It's coming. So you could argue we don't need to tell them because they're all going to know it anyway. Data is everything. And I think we all know that. And the National Esophageal Gastric Cancer Audit is the largest audit of esophageal gastric cancer worldwide by a long, long way. Um, it is absolutely clear, it's associated, and I would say it's been part, partly causative in falling of mortality rates, and it undoubtedly drives standardisation of practice. Um, it, it's crucial that we have clinical ownership of data, because it does drive quality, and it certainly drives standardisation. But I would say that data collection remains a huge problem. It certainly is in our trust. It certainly is in every single trust that contributes to our national order. It is inadequately resourced in Oxford, in virtually every trust I've come across, and it remains a huge problem. I think we need to look at how we resource data collection properly, both here and elsewhere. It's going to become more and more reliant on HES data. COSD, which is a cancer outcome and service data set, which is the, the NHS England cancer database, which is all trusts are mandated to put data into that. It's, 
pretty poorly filled out. That may well be the future of proper cancer outcomes date, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 funding. But I think probably the way to do this in the future is to link data collection to payment. So the commissioners should not pay the trust for cancer treatment unless they can demonstrate they're adequately resourcing data collection. I'll leave it like that, which gives a few minutes for questions. <laughs>